So high on Yeah, uh, is is this working? I, I don't know. If. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. I have to just be closer. Yeah. So she will speak on you. Uh, the title of her talk is ah. Uh, the title of her talk is the black screen my phone is giving me right now. Um, the title of her talk is you sound depressed. A case study on sound health. Diagnostic use of voice analysis AI. So, Anna, without further ado, please. Okay, sure. <clears throat> uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining me today for my first ever conference presentation. My name is Anna Ma, and I'm a master's student. Um, who studies disability and AI at the intersection of science and technology studies and critical disability studies. Um, today I will be presenting our case study on Sound Health's diagnostic use of voice analysis-based AI. So before I dive into my critique of Sound Health, it's important to understand the theoretical perspectives I used that are drawn from science and technology studies and critical disability studies. For those unfamiliar with these two disciplines, STS investigates the interplay between social, political, and cultural values and scientific research and technological innovation. CDS views disability as a social, political, and cultural phenomenon instead of an individual medical condition. This approach stands out from traditional disability studies by its intersectional perspective that interlinks with other critical theories, such as critical race theory and queer theory. <clears throat> so you may be asking, why am I problematizing the use of voice analysis AI to diagnose depression? While many companies claim voice data collection is unobtrusive, which is increasingly turning voice into a new surveillance frontier, as suggested by Joseph Turo. Given the discrete nature of devices like Amazon's Alexa or Google Home, voice surveillance could become more pervasive than other surveillance forms. I'm concerned this could stealthily create a dystopian scenario of profiling based on AI-generated assumptions of voice. The implications are worrisome, especially for depression identification due to the depression stigma. In a private or for-profit health insurance context, depression detection could impact costs or accessibility for those tagged as depressed and possibly enable non-consensual targeted advertising. Many people would be affected by voice-based psychiatric profiling. The World Health Organization estimates depression is one of the world's most common mental disorders and it's the largest contributor to global disability. 
Regarding my case study methodology, I selected Sound Health because of the extensive public information about its voice analysis technology. Unlike other startups, Sound provides greater transparency through its developer documentation, research publications, and white papers. Crucially, Sound's voice analysis app is um, currently available and readily downloaded at the App Store. So let me tell you more about Sound Health. Sound is a well-funded, Boston-based health technology company that has received mainstream press coverage for purporting to offer objective depression monitoring and, detect and detection via its mental fitness app that records and analyzes a 30-second sample of the user's voice. Today, we'll be scrutinizing this app. Sound's mental fitness app employs audio signal processing and machine learning to analyze acoustic features from a user's 30-second speech sample. These acoustic features are seen as vocal biomarkers that are, quote, objective measurements made from speech signals that convey health or wellness information relevant to the speaker, unquote. Based on these biomarkers, the app generates a mental fitness score, claiming to indicate the user's psychiatric well-being. I conducted a textual analysis of Sans' extensive documentation with a specific focus on its API documentation as a rich text since it is written for other computing professionals to make use of and lacks the salesmanship and oversimplification of a press kit. Guided by insights from CDS and STS, my co-authors and I identified three hegemonic themes reflecting underlying assumptions in this technology, which I will discuss next along with contextual pieces of background for each theme. The first hegemonic ideal we came across is Sans' problematic tendency to reduce humans to a single score. In order to fully grasp the, ram the ramifications of Sans' problematic reductionism, some background on eugenics and human ranking is necessary. In essence, eugenics originated from Francis Galton's 19th century ideas, aims to control populations using misguided biological justifications rooted in racism and ableism. This thinking persisted into the 20th century, and although the word eugenics has stopped being used post-World War II, the idea still remains and sadly continues today, manifesting in discriminatory immigration laws or even forced sterilizations. Furthermore, eugenic epist epistemologies are presently being incorporated into AI technologies with studies claiming to determine traits like criminality or employability from physical characteristics. Human ranking is a core component of eugenics and was popularized through IQ testing. Eugenicists leveraged the single measure to rank human value, committing to two significant fallacies as identified by Stephen Jay Gould. The first one being ranking, or the oversimplification of complex variation into a gradually ascending scale, and the second one being reification, or the conversion of abstract concepts into real-world entities. Eugenicists wrongly assumed their findings were objective and universal, overlooking considerations of race, class, gender, culture, and disability. The seemingly benign concept of fitness stems from eugenics, determining who is fit to enhance the gene pool and who is unfit. This displayed quote from Son's API documentation illustrates how Son conceives of its reductive technology. Son directly states that a higher mental fitness score implies stronger mental fitness and vice versa. It likens mental fitness to physical fitness, aiming to gauge one's ability to manage symptoms of depression, anxiety, and stress, all quantified into a single score. This resembles Stephen Jay Gould's fallacy of ranking concept, where complex psychometrics are oversimplified into a single well-ordered scale, a method that has historically been used to enact discrimination in various aspects of society. I'm not disputing the useful role of quantification in healthcare. However, the problems lie in aggregating different measures and oversimplifying mental health into one score, which obscures clinically useful information and endorses a eugenicist view of human mental state ranking. The second hegemonic ideal we observed in our analysis was that of the promise of objectivity. Drawing on notable STS scholars like Sandra Harding and Donna Haraway, this paper emphasizes that knowledge claims cannot be fully objective. Harding and Haraway employ feminist standpoint theory, which connects one's epistemic position to one's social position, particularly considering factors like race and gender. Instead of an unbiased view from nowhere that generalizes knowledge claims, this theory asserts that knowledge is situated, limited, and dependent on the observer's perspectives, objectives, and interests, which are all shaped 
by their sociopolitical and historical subject identity. Thus, true object objectivity in knowledge claims is unattainable as knowledge claims mirror the specific sociopolitical and historical context they arise from. Son, however, consistently promotes the objectivity of its technology on its website, including its API. It claims to provide objective and numerical mental fitness scores to track objective changes in mental fitness via vocal biomarkers. However, as Amy Ham Rye warns, concepts like universal, objective, and scientific operate as persuasive devices. I argue that Sans objectivity claims are mainly a marketing ploy to validate its technology. Sans not alone in this. Many tech companies downplay the influence of, influence of social location and identity on knowledge production. Many critics have pointed out that AI often projects an unfounded appearance of objectivity, which can problematically mislead authorities and users. The final hegemonic ideal we noticed in Sand's documentation is the belief in universal biomarkers. Sand identifies eight acoustic features in, a, in user voice recordings as biomarkers. Smoothness, control, liveliness, energy range, clarity, crispness, speech rate, and pause duration. Sand claims that these biomarkers, which it frames as truly universal speech features, positively correlate with mental fitness. Like objectivity, STS scholars like Haraway challenge the concept of universality, arguing that all knowledge is situated local and inherently limited. This theory of situated knowledges suggests that all knowledge is influenced by the circumstances of its production and the social identities of its creators, thus eliminating the possibility of truly universal or fully complete knowledge claims. Okay. Song consistently claims its vocal biomarkers are globally applicable, yet fails to detail the demographics of, demographics of its reference population for these biomarkers' typical values. It asserts that these reference ranges are validated across international multilingual data sets, but doesn't provide any accuracy rate. Strikingly, there's no public mention of its machine learning model's overall accuracy. The lack of clear data about the model's training training and testing alongside the vagueness around data collection locations within diverse nations like India and the US adds to the concerns about SANS technology. Furthermore, its universal biomarkers have been shown in academic literature to be, to, to be culturally contingent, gender contingent, or based on ableist assumptions. While time doesn't permit a deep dive into each biomarker, our paper explains how SANS approach fails to consider differences like respiratory impairments, regional and sp gendered speech variations, native versus non-native speech differences, and cultural speech variations, among other oversights. I would like to stress that while I did highlight many of the ways that Sans Mental Fitness app fails to cater to a universal audience, I do not think the appropriate solution would be to simply broaden the scope of Sans data sets in order to include the data of the excluded groups. Echoing Anna Lauren Hoffman's critique on inclusion discourses and data ethics, superficial inclusion doesn't address deeper structural oppression. Simply including excluded groups in Sans data sets or making its machine learning algorithms more transparent doesn't fix the inherent issues with its single score mental health assessment, nor does it fix Sans' problematic claims to objectivity and universality. The technology's ranking fallacy persists regardless of improved inclusivity or explainability. This leads me to recommend that technologists should not only refine input data, but also understand the public interpretation of their machine learning outputs to prevent misinterpretation by non-technologists. A single score output like SANS may cause users to accept it without question. Therefore, improving data science isn't enough. We also need to improve HCI and UX design to foster critical AI literacy. Introducing measures like error bars to show the model's uncertainty would be a good place to start. Ultimately, I suggest that further research is required or on responsible ways to present AI, AI model outputs to the public. We also need technologists to view this kind of research as an integral part of their job in the machine learning life cycle. Thank you for attending my talk. Um, please see our paper for more details on vocal biomarker critique, reflexivity, limitations, and future work. Um, I had some discussion questions, but I think we're definitely out of time. But thank you, everyone.
Hi everyone, my name is Natalie and I'll be presenting our paper, Anti-Intentional Harms, the Conceptual Pitfalls of Emotion AI in Education, on behalf of myself and my co-author, Dr. Luke Stark. So to start, just a brief overview on what I seek to do in this talk. First is to understand what Emotion AI is and how it's being used in education and why. Secondly, to understand the conceptual underpinnings of these technologies. Third, to understand how these technologies are harmful in virtue of those underpinnings. And finally, to consider three potential policy responses to these harms. So to start, just a quick overview on what Emotion AI actually is. Emotion AI technologies claim the ability to detect the true inner emotional state of individuals by collecting biometric information such as face scans, voice recordings, and traces of physical movement. These systems are gaining popularity in many contexts, including and especially in education, where they're mainly being used to measure attention and interest of students during lessons. To really understand their popularity, though, it's helpful for us to take a brief look at some of the histories and motivations behind these systems' use. Human emotion has historically been a vector of biopolitical control, serving as evidence, or lack thereof, for one's maturity and competence. The increasingly popular therapeutic narrative suggested that individuals can improve themselves to meet their own self-actualization, in part through their emotional expression. This in turn promoted the idea of emotional malleability, which has persisted into the 21st century. The idea that our emotions can be molded and shaped then kickstarted the idea of emotion management for economic ends today. School systems are increasingly being encouraged to nudge students to behave in a way that's been deemed economically valuable. Think, for example, of priming them to best perform emotional labor in the workplace. To build these technologies, though, developers have to import a conceptual understanding of what emotion actually is. But this is a decision which, as we will see, has serious implications for justice and fairness. So conceptual understandings of emotion have traditionally been divided into two camps, intentionalism and anti-intentionalism. The former suggests that emotions are cognitive in nature and are subject to reasons. So for example, I am sad because it is raining. Anti-intentionalism though, suggests that emotions aren't subject to reasons or indeed meaning at all. Instead, emotions exist as innate automatically automatic, pre-cognitive, pre-conscious, triggered brain-body behaviors, which operate outside the domain of consciousness. Paul Ekman's basic emotion theory, which holds that there exists some number of discrete universal emotions like joy, sadness, anger, etc., exemplifies anti-intentionalism and is extremely influential and successful, despite being criticized on grounds of its reliability and validity. But part of basic emotions appeal is that it suggests that emotions are quantifiable and measurable states, thus promoting and allowing these goals of children's emotion management for economic ends. Importantly, anti-intentionalist basic emotion theory undergirds the vast majority of emotion AI systems today. So it's really important to emphasize that the existence of these technologies and their underlying theoretical and conceptual commitments are no accident. These systems belong to pervasive neoliberal capitalist agendas, which entrench their popularity and use in the first place. But we argue that these systems come with serious harm. What happens when schools integrate emotion AI technologies designed using anti-intentionalist frameworks into the classroom? Well, we can imagine the system first ascribing an effective state onto a child, like excitement or boredom. This claim will then be interpreted by the system's user, likely a teacher. The teacher might believe and reiterate the AI system's claim for various reasons. They might trust the system already, or have already suspected that the child was not paying attention. Because anti-intentionalist theories relocate the exhibition of emotion away from a subject's cognitive appraisal and towards automatic bodily responses, student emotions detected by anti-intentionalist emotion AI technologies would properly be understood by teachers as evidence of some condition or situation that's intrinsic to the child. 
rather than on the basis of any justifiable reason for the student's expression of that emotion. So if a child is bored, it must be because some stimulus has activated the behavioral physiological response that correlates to the expression of an innate state of boredom, not because the child cognitively feels uninspired by science class. The key point is that if emotions bypass cognition and reason, then system judgments can't be justified by reason. Anti-intentionalism suggests that the emotion is just there, beyond the subject's conscious reflection. The problem is that this entails that the child has no logical or conceptual space to push back against any judgments made by the system. So they can't protest and claim that they weren't actually bored because of reason X or Y, because the anti-intentionalist expression of boredom, as assessed by the system, is not subject to reasons at all. The result is that children are disempowered to push back against any assessments made by these systems about their own mental states. To demand justification for their claims, is simply incompatible with that anti-intentionalist framework for understanding what emotions are. We submit this as a serious harm against children and youth. And their inherent lack of justifiability opens the door to a host of other issues, like potentially granting credence to unfair teacher judgments, producing chilling effects to students afraid to be typologized as an a child, emotional child, or a problem child, reinforcing discrimination against already disempowered marginalized groups in classrooms, and more. And this is all especially serious when we remember how children's emotional expressions are being tied to their future opportunities and success. So the natural question becomes, well, what can we do about this? We might think, well, what if we modified our interpretation of anti-intentionalist systems in the classroom? What if we taught teachers to judge the claims of the emotion AI system with caution and not automatically just take them as the truth? Unfortunately, though, it's doubtful that this is a practical goal. Remember, remember that intentionality in this context involves emotion being directed towards objects and holding meaning. It doesn't entail deliberateness. If a teacher were to attempt to thwart the problems of anti-intentionalism by adopting an in intentionalist interpretation of a claim made by a machine grounded in anti-intentionalism, then they're likely to just inappropriately import notions like deliberateness or agency onto it, which could open the door to unfair discipline of students from the other end of the spectrum by punishing them on the assumption that any problematic behavior is an entirely deliberate act. Students can intentionally emote without conscious deliberateness. Okay, so what if we just abandon anti-intentionalist frameworks when developing emotion AI tech for education and just use in intentionalist frameworks instead. But we submit this won't work either. Basic emotion theory is extremely widespread, widely integrated and accepted. And what's more is that intentionalist theories of emotion seem to be incompatible with emotion AI technology entirely. Because if emotions were non-discrete, numerous or even infinite states that vary cross-culturally, then the predictive models deployed by emotion AI systems would require enormous sophistication, and it's doubtful that they could be engineered at all. What if we abandon these technologies altogether? We believe that abandoning emotion AI systems entirely in the context of education would be the ideal solution to the issues described today. The anti-intentionalism at the root of these technologies makes their assessments automatically compromised. We acknowledge, however, that it doesn't seem likely that these technologies will be easily given up by their current users or developers, given both the popularity of basic emotion theory and, again, the strong political agenda invested in implementing these systems and cultivating desirable human emotional capital. Pushback against the agendas behind these technologies is a political challenge. Nonetheless, and despite this challenge, we maintain that the sole good remedy for the harms we have elucidated here is the abolition and abandonment of these systems in the context of teaching and learning. We maintain that these harms are serious and we hope that this work helps to raise awareness of those harms that these systems allow and to motivate this abolition. That's all and thank you all very much for listening.
I'm Edward B. King, and I'll be starting as an assistant professor of critical digital studies at New York University in the fall. This paper, titled On the Politics and Praxis of AI Speech Emotion Recognition, examines how the complex ontologies of emotion are technologically reconciled within the epistemic bounds of machine learning, specifically in the context of AI Speech Emotion Recognition, or SER. Dr. Bjorn Schuler defines speech emotion recognition as the discipline of automatically recognizing human emotions and affective states from speech. It's important, however, to take a step back and instead of just assuming that we know what emotion means in SER, we need to seriously consider the fundamental question that underlies that definition. What is emotion and how does one know or hear it? Well, it turns out that no one knows. No one can agree on what emotion really is. These are two broad categories of emotion theories that are invoked in psychology literature, but there are so many variations of these and more. Basic emotion theory is the most simplistic model of emotion popularized by people like Paul Ekman, and it's been heavily critiqued for its reductiveness. This model sees these six emotions, sometimes the number changes, but the premise is the same, as biologically hardwired and therefore universal across humans. James Russell is one of the greatest critics of this notion. He says that basic emotion theory is ultimately a folk theory made scientific. So if we consider, for instance, the fear we might feel suddenly encountering a bear in the woods, that fear is very different from the fear someone who paid to watch a horror movie in the theaters might feel. So Russell appropriately asks, what other than the label fear do various instances of fear share with each other that they do not share with what is not fear? There may be no one scientific model that applies to all cases of fear and only to fear. Instead of emotion, Russell proposes a dimensional model of core affect that orthogonally maps valence, positive versus negative, activation, also sometimes referred to as arousal, and dominance, how in control someone feels of the situation, in a three-dimensional plane. In the interest of time, I'm not going to delve much deeper into this, but the key point for our discussion is that this is a model that was proposed out of a dissatisfaction with the simplicity of discrete emotion theory. It's proposed as a model that can accommodate emotional descriptors without being bound to the label as a fixed and universal ontology. This ontological complexity of emotion is important because for emotion to be made legible to a machine learning system, it needs to be bounded, defined, and instantiated as ground truth. This table is from Rosalind Picard's book, Affective Computing, and here she asks, what is a good computational mapping between emotions and speech patterns? As you can see in the columns, the ways that emotion is taxonomized is through the categories given in basic or discrete emotion theory. As Florian Jatan has written about, once a particular ontology is accepted as a usable ground truth or taxonomy in ML, it serves as the bedrock for further studies, benchmarks, and evaluation metrics. It entrenches itself as the default way of framing a particular task. We see that this is definitely the case for the numerous SER-related studies that followed Picard's mapping over the next decade, starting with his paper in 1996. In contrast to Picard, who only conceptualized these mappings, Dallaire et al. actually needed to physically produce emotion for their emotion recognition system. For this, they used actors who were given scripts associated with emotional labels and asked to read the script with that emotion. They write in the methodology paper that the actors were instructed to base their performances on a framework called believable agents, which is actually a term coined by computer scientist Joseph Bates based on a philosophy of animation developed by Disney artists in the 80s. You can read the full paper for a more detailed description of how this Disney philosophy was adopted. What's important here is that various different adaptations of the staged method of categorical emotional performance still comprises the primary way that emotional ground truths are constructed for SER today. This is a list of the top 10 most cited open source SER datasets that I examined along with their accompanying methodology papers, all of which use actors to produce the emotional expressions. Broadly, the actors follow two methods of emotional performance, one, communication effect acting, or CEA, and two, felt experience acting, or FEA. CEA is when an expressor produces an emotion specified by an emotional label in a way that the expressor and the recorder believe optimizes the recognition of the emotion by external observers. For example, an actor is given a sentence or phrase and asked to say that phrase in an angry way, and that becomes an instance of angriness in the dataset. So this obviously runs into generalizability problems. One person's angriness is specific to that person and situation, both in terms of its expression and its perception. So to give you an example of how silly these can get, here's an example of an ah that was produced for the MAV dataset with the instructional label of angry. Ah! 
FEA tries to address this limitation of lack of authenticity by implementing what actors might call method acting, or the use of vivid mental imagery techniques so that expressors can recall personal past events when they felt the target emotion. Here's a photo from the Emo Cat methodology paper that shows how these emotional elicitations were captured. Apparently, having eight cameras in your face is a great setup for eliciting authentic emotional expressions. A non-trivial aspect of this methodology, however, is the IRB. Because this would be considered human subjects research, which requires the study facilitators to make sure there's no psychologically disconcerting experiences for the participants, the question is, how do you ethically elicit psychologically disconcerting emotions such as anger, fear, or sadness? This is never addressed in the methodology papers. Essentially, what they need to do is frame the elicitation process in the IRB protocol as not really psychologically disconcerting, which then raises the question, how authentic is FEA? It doesn't actually address any of the limitations of CEA and its performativity. Ultimately, the limitation of both FEA and CEA is that an emotional expression is always just an instance of emotion tied to the context of production, a production that is heavily guided and designed by the creators of the dataset. A woman reading a sentence accompanied by the label joy in a way that both she and the study facilitators perceive to be joyful might indeed be an instance of joy, but it doesn't represent a generalizable representation of joy neither within nor across subject. This is true regardless of whether it's a product of a script or an authentic elicitation. One of the primary commercial use cases for SER is call center optimization. Kojido is the biggest name in this space. They monitor conversations between call center operators and customers and analyze acoustic voice signals to give agents cues on how to adjust their behaviors. In an interview, the company COO stated that positive emotional evaluations of agents by its SER system boosts agents' chances of performance-related bonuses. The flip side of that, of course, is a performance-related penalty related to behaviors that might be categorized as a negative emotional evaluation. This means there's an explicit link between emotional regulation and worker compensation facilitated through an SER system that functions as a surveillance tool that constantly monitors operators' conversations. Here, operators are seen through a dehumanizing lens akin to what Jeff Nagy describes in the context of autism mitigation programs and facial emotion recognition, where autistic individuals are understood as a modular assemblage of adjustable behaviors that can be reoriented to fit a conversationally productive and desired normal. A normal that, as I stated earlier about SER datasets, is a narrowly defined set of emotional caricatures. For Kojito, the workers now have the additional labor of making themselves legible and desirable to the data structures newly entwined in their performance reviews. Sarah Rose documents how disability was a concept that was invented in the 19th century as a byproduct of the wage economy, when employers began to use pre-employment screenings to eliminate people deemed inefficient, non-productive, and likely to require extra help and support. In this history, the lack of ability to conform to particular notions of productivity effectively rendered an individual disabled, thereby disqualifying the person from participating in the workplace and earning a living. Kojito's use of SER as a mode of worker surveillance continues this history of ableist workplace politics in which its subjects are problematically located on an expanded spectrum of emotional suspects that require constant monitoring and validating. In this way, Kojito's SER can also be interpreted as a disabling technology that transposes the systemic oppression of disabled individuals onto its users. To be clear, this is by no means to argue that the systemic oppression of disabled people should be contained, but rather the opposite. It's to problematize the deficit model of disability and neurodivergence altogether, so as to argue that such ways of thinking ultimately make such oppressive structures more widespread. I believe we're at a critical junction in the development of SER because it's at the cusp of being widely adopted in higher stakes contexts. Similar to the way that facial emotion recognition was recently dropped by Microsoft due to its tenuous scientific foundations and risks associated with high stakes applications, we should also understand SER within the same context. The ML community has a tendency to position ML as an all-encompassing solution. It recruits complex problems and simplifies and distills them down to the point that they fit and make sense within its classificatory framework. In this paper, I sought to shed light on the complications that occur in this process of distillation or translation in the context of speech emotion recognition. Thank you for listening. Uh, our next speaker is Ulla Petty from uh, Cambridge.
Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Ulla Petti. I am presenting our paper on the ethical considerations in the early detection of Alzheimer's disease using speech and AI. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Rune Nurup, Jeffrey Skopek and Anna Krohonen. Uh, I will start by providing some background information and then explaining the motivations for writing this paper. So research in Alzheimer's disease detection is increasingly relevant due to the aging population. And while it can be ch challenging to diagnose, it's been found that changes in speech and language can appear years or even decades before the official diagnosis. So this means that speech has the potential to help develop non-invasive, fast, cheap and accessible screening tools. Uh, while it's a promising area of research, many new ethical considerations uh, arise, especially when we introduce uh, AI and natural language processing for diagnostic purposes and use the speech data from the individuals with potential cognitive decline. Uh, in our paper, uh, we aim to outline and discuss these concerns and provide recommendations for developing the ethical guidelines and best practices. Uh, we group the ethical concerns into five broad categories, autonomy, privacy and data protection, welfare, transparency and fairness. I will briefly uh, introduce some of the points from each section that we discuss in our paper. So the autonomy related concerns that we look at are informed consent, depersonalization and disclosure of research outcomes. Uh, informed consent is an important area as we are working with people with potential cognitive de decline and depending on disease stage, the researcher might uh, have to take extra care to ensure that the participants understand the risks and benefits involved. For example, by using simpler language and visual aids in the consent form and information sheets, or in longitudinal studies where the speaker's condition might worsen over time, consider using gradual informed consent uh, transfer. As language is often connected to personhood, there is a risk of depersonalizing those with uh, language impairment and portraying them as incapable of meaningful decision making. This can make the individuals vulnerable to paternalistic attitudes and behaviors whereby decisions are made for them. And we highlight the importance of treating the disease that contributes to communication difficulties as separate from the person. When looking at the disclosure, it's important to respect the person's right to know and not to know the research outcome and be clear about the pr process of how uh, the results are communicated. In AI-aided detection, it's also important to uh, explain that the model can be wrong, as this may impact the subject's decision on whether or not they wish to know the research outcome. Uh, while collecting spontaneous speech data is increasingly feasible, several concerns arise. So spontaneous speech data can carry personal content and voice is an identifier. While this is true in any domain using speech data, working with people with potential cognitive decline makes it especially relevant. So here we need to consider how well the speaker understands the personal content being shared, how it will be used and how we as researchers can best protect them. Similarly, linking identifiable voice data um, to personal health information, such as Alzheimer's disease or the risk of Alzheimer's disease introduces additional uh, risks. So there are several suggestions how to, um, how to reduce such risks, for example, reducing speech intelligibility, using automatic feature extraction or giving the participants control over their recording device. 
In the welfare section, one of the concerns that we look at is the stress that uh, participating or being in this type of research can cause. So going through cognitive uh, testing can be stressful. Uh, we mm, highlight the importance of choosing the data collection methods that cause the least uh, discomfort to the participants. For example, rather than using intense um, cognitive testing, we recommend using uh, spontaneous speech in friendly environment um, and so on. And uh, similarly, uh, being informed about uh, the signs of progressive neurological condition that doesn't have a cure is distressing and it can lead to the development of negative self-image or even suicide. Research reliability is another aspect that may contribute to welfare-related concerns. So here we have to consider two things the adequacy of language data and the adequacy of the models. Uh, language tests may struggle to capture the challenges that the persons with Alzheimer's disease face in everyday situations. And they might also be insensitive to communication-related cultural differences. Model accuracy concerns in this domain are largely related to very little data being available, small sample size and overfitting, and incomparability across studies. We also discuss the risk of discrimination. So, uh, yeah, early signs of Alzheimer's disease can impact the person's job opportunities, endurance, legal status, and access to healthcare. And it's especially uh, important to acknowledge the risk of unethical and dual use when the signs of disease are extracted from everyday speech data, which is very easy to collect. Um, it's essential that clinical decision making is transparent and interpretable. We looked at interpretability on two levels, so language features and decision making. Uh, as more speech data becomes available and more AI systems are used, it's likely that the domain expert features will be replaced by the features that perform better, uh, which is likely then compromise the interpretability of the features. This also plays a role in understanding why a certain decision about the participant's health has been made and which aspects of language uh, use have contributed. So explainable AI is an active area of research and several uh, techniques have been proposed. Um, in our paper, we also ask like, who the um, uh, explanations are meant for. If they're meant for uh, developers, that would help us develop better AI as we can understand the predictions and address errors. Um, if they're made for clinicians, it can help the doctors who use AI to support diagnosis. Uh, and allow them to understand why a model has made a prediction, whether to trust it, uh, as well as to explain treatment recommendations to the patients. And we stress the importance of including clinician input in developing transparent models. Uh, fairness. So while many studies in this domain uh, state that the development of automatic speech-based early detection tools would make Alzheimer's disease screening more accessible, promote the quality, improve the quality of life of the elderly. It's important to ask whose quality of life will be improved and who will benefit from such research. So, for example, uh, the lack of available treatment and the advanced age of the research subjects is, it's kind of unlikely that the people who participate in the research directly benefit from it themselves. But who will benefit from this research in the future? The design of the current studies has a great impact on the future ho outcome. However, current data sets are often unbalanced. A lot of the models are trained on the weird population and based on English language. Mm, as the models are only applicable to the population they've been trained on, it leads to disproportionate distribution of benefits, meaning that the research will largely benefit the rich Western countries. There are several uh, suggestions to boost the fair distribution of research benefits, balanced data sets, uh, including various languages and minority populations using 
uh, bias assessment toolkits and data set uh, descriptions. Okay, in summary, we provided an overview of the ethical considerations in the early detection of uh, Alzheimer's disease using speech and AI and developed a list of 65 recommendations to aid the development of guidelines and best practices. Uh, the beginning of it is shown here, but it's a few pages, so see our paper for the full list. Uh, key takeaways are to make decisions with the best interests of the participants in mind and be clear about the communication, consider the potential consequences of developing new technologies and be aware of the risk of dual use and discrimination or harm. Focus on the explainability of the models and include clinician input in the process, include diverse population and, and ensure fair distribution of research benefits. Thank you. The next, the next speaker is uh, Anna Choi, and uh, she's from Cornell University. She'll speak on augmented data sheets for speech data sets and ethical decision making. Uh, note to the speakers, after uh, this presentation with the speakers who are in the room, please uh, come to the stage because we'll have a 10 minute question and answer session. Hi, I'm Anna. No, I'm not. <laughs> Hi, I'm Orestes. I am co-author with Anna and we will be presenting our paper Augmented Datasets for Speech Datasets and Ethical Decision Making, which was performed in collaboration uh, across Sony AI and Cornell and authors' identities include uh, linguists, uh, uh, speech practitioners, algorithmic fairness experts and legal practitioners. Um, so the study builds upon uh, the seminal paper of Kebru et al. datasets for datasets and provide uh, augmented datasets specifically for speech data uh, and uh, beyond using the datasets as a transparency mechanism, we also focus on ethical decision making as an outcome of using the datasets by practitioners and researchers. So why speech? So, oh. Why speech? So uh, we've all seen speech language uh, technologies in our everyday lives, uh, Alexa and Siri are ones, and usually we think of low stake applications of these technologies. Uh, nonetheless, there are broad applications uh, in high stake contexts, for example, to support individuals with disabilities, uh, to ensure uh, safe driving, um, uh, doctors use them to transcribe patients' uh, notes, uh, all, as well as they are used in courtroom, uh, in the courtroom to transcribe uh, individuals' uh, speech. And of course, Darth Vader was also using speech synthesis. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, as you know that uh, speech language technologies also contain biases uh, and many audits have uh, uncovered specific biases and many of these issues can be traced back to the lack of diverse or uh, appropriate data on which the models are trained on. Uh, for example, Koenig and Tal in 2020 uncovered that commercial speech recognition systems uh, were uh, performing much worse uh, on black Americans compared to white Americans. While uh, Lopez et al. in 2023 showed that uh, uh, individual that systems uh, would also work much worse to individuals uh, with dysphonic speech. Uh, and uh, somebody can uh, speculate that the issue or these disparities come from the actual data that the models were trained on. Um, so one reason why these problems uh, appear is the difficulty in speech data collection. It is a time consuming and very complex task. And for example, uh, when you train a model on speech data that have been collected on individuals who just read Wikipedia, the models will perform very differently compared to uh, a model trained on data uh, which include the spontaneous speech of individuals. 
Uh, furthermore, the complexity becomes even higher when we, can, we consider the different languages of individuals, the accents, dialects, um, age groups uh, in the society and other demographic uh, parameters. Furthermore, there can be code switching when individuals speak, uh, speaking, different speaking styles or speech impairments might influence also uh, the performance of the models. And to showcase this in the paper, we performed a literature review and, for example, we showed that most statuses focus on only on languages. Um, they don't have a high diversity in terms of uh, age on the individuals who are included in the data sets and less than a handful uh, data sets actually contained uh, non-binary gender metadata uh, on the collected data. So taking all this into consideration, uh, we, we were motivated to expand the, data, the existing data sets and document them in order to provide information in them about how the data are recorded, to, make, uh, to provide information about how a data set might be useful uh, to users and when, uh, but also to be used as a template when the practitioners actually develop data sets and make them think about who and how should be included in the data set they are developing. And to achieve this, we performed a large-scale uh, data set and uh, paper literature review where we uncovered uh, properties that data sets have or should have in terms of diversity, inclusion, and privacy. Uh, as well as um, considerations that researchers have made about what properties data sets should have. And based on this uh, knowledge we created, we formulated questions that we added in the original version of the data sets for data sets. Um, okay, so we're proposing uh, three additional uh, questions in the motivation section, including questions regarding whether the data set used, the audio data used, was red speech or spontaneous speech. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, and we're also uh, proposing 10 additional speech questions regarding data composition, including quite more um, information about linguistic subpopulation, notes on written transcriptions accompanying the audio files, and so on. We're proposing five additional speech questions regarding data collection process. This includes questions about technicality, including which specific microphones were used, or what about the um, recording environment, the lab environment. Also, there are questions regarding the background noises included. This correlates to the questions about whether um, different socioeconomic groups are represented in the data collection process, because differing amounts and different levels of background noises, ambient noises are correlated um, to different geological locations. We propose uh, six additional questions on data processing. These include questions about consistency in transcription annotation, also about transcription conventions regarding hate speech or swear words. Lastly, we propose four additional questions on data use, distribution, and maintenance. These include questions such as redaction, whether sensitive information are carefully redacted, or personally identifiable information, or only redacted from the transcription, but not from the audio files. Finally, to encourage practical and actual uses of our speech-specific data sheets, we uh, provide um, fillable templates of the data sheets on our GitHub page for you guys to use as practitioners or um, data set creators. We also have, for reference, uh, we provide worked examples of five of the most widely spread, um, widely used speech data sets so that you guys can refer to these, and these are also um, available on our GitHub page. Finally, we want to end with some calls for action. Firstly, we call on data set creators so that they can fill out speech-specific data sheets to transparently document not only the contents, but also the collection processes of the data set. Secondly, we call on speech practitioners to consult um, data sheets when choosing which data sets to use, allowing for better um, consideration of speech diversity and linguistics of populations. 
Finally, we call on broader the speech community to view our data sheets as something to iterate and contemplate on together with speech minoritized communities, including with data set subjects and users. Thank you all for your time and attention, and we hope you will consider using our augmented data sheets for speech data sets. Yeah, may I request the speakers once again to come to the come to the stage and uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Actually, you can just step up uh, to the microphone if you have any questions and we can handle questions on a first come first served basis. Uh, Okay, did you folks understand the question? The audio was not great. Okay, so, so let me paraphrase. Let me take the liberty of paraphrasing. And you know, you can tell me whether I paraphrased it correctly. Um, so what he's asking is the following. He's saying that mostly we seem to be talking about patients in most of the presentations today. We are not talking about the actual professionals like doctors. So if we were talking about doctors, would these criteria change in some way? Uh, right? Yeah, approximately, yes. That's yes. right. To which study does this question refer to? I'm sorry? To which study does this question refer to? To which study? Um, let's say yours. <laughs> <laughs> to which study, excuse me. To which study? Which of the presentations are you referring to? Uh, I'm sorry, it was, it was to No, no, he's, he's the addressing the question to the whole group, saying that as a group, he noticed that we were functioning, uh, we were focusing on vulnerable populations. But he's saying if you turn it around and focus on the people who are serving those vulnerable populations, how would these guidelines change? Say if we were collecting uh, clinicians speaking, how would we change these guidelines? If, if we would, that is. Anyone want to take a shot at this? Why don't I put one of you on the spot? Yes. What do you think? Uh, is the question about like recording just healthy people or? Uh, they, they are professionals though. They are the people who are serving these. Uh, so let's say doctors, actually, let's be very narrow. Suppose we just had doctors, would you need to change these guidelines in some way and presume that they are healthy? Um, I guess if, um, if we were to be answering uh, this question in terms of our pay study, um, if we're trying to collect data as pertaining to doctor speech or professional speech in terms of like um, specific uh, profession, then we would be collecting data sets as in terms of jargon specific, such as like uh, if you, uh, we're collecting data sets from professionals that use finance specific language or uh, medical specific language, will be, it would be data set um, specific to those areas and that would be the focus of the data sets. What is important is that we don't um, presume that all of the speakers are uh, healthy or speaking a certain dialect or certain accent, we presume that because the focus is on specific um, area or specific vocabulary, that is the focus and it is important to mention that and clearly state that, but there won't be any presumption regarding any of the other things that are not the focus of the data sets. I wasn't sure if that was what you're referring to, but I'm, hope, I'm answering for no, all the In the interest speakers. of time, I think we can take the rest offline, but he appears to be satisfied though, from whatever I can tell from the mask. Uh, uh. <laughs> uh, yes, please, go ahead. I, um, I had a question for Anna Ma. Um, 
So yeah, nice talk. And I like the way that you use the API as a kind of a primary source um, for your critique. And I noticed that your critique was sort of uh, problematizing the, the task itself, which I think is very appropriate. But in terms of how you studied the API, I was also wondering how much insight you got into how the machine learning is actually working. How do they define the target label for this like scalar, you know, mental fitness quotient? And right. Is that actually something you can glean from studying the API? Was that kind of obscured? And what any reflections on that process would be? Um, I didn't come across any specifics in the API documentation. Um, I found those types of specifics um, in the patents for the technology. Um, so if you're interested, that's where I would go looking. Um, but to be frank, like I said, I'm not someone who creates technology. Um, I didn't necessarily have, I have like a very like introductory technical background, so I didn't feel like it was my place to interpret um, higher level specifics. Um, but yeah, um, I mainly approached um, the analysis from just like an STS and CDS um, background. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Hello? Hello? Okay. Uh, hi. I have a question for uh, Natalie, though. Um, for Natalie. So, Natalie, uh, we'll have to type it into Hopin. She said that she's following Hop Hopin. So, why don't you speak the question out? Okay. And we'll have a trusty volunteer type in the question, and we'll hope that. Uh, okay. She well, uh, thank you for bringing up these very, very salient ethical issues around. Uh, emotional detection. Uh, I found the claim that we should completely prohibit, shut down this this kind of AI as pretty provocative, and I'm not completely convinced um, for one major reason. So, actually, emotionally detecting students' emotions can have a lot of utility. Um, human tutors can look at students and say, like, I I see that you're not engaging with this material, you just don't seem to like it, how can I help you? And asking students, like, how are you feeling? How can I help you? Actually enhances their autonomy a lot. So are we really to deny students this potential benefit from this development of this AI? I would okay, so the, the, yeah, I think we understand the question. Have you typed it into... Hopin, she said that she'd be monitoring Hopin and Zoom and all that. So we'll give her 30 seconds to respond. Otherwise, I would recommend that you should certainly, uh, you know, talk to her offline about this. You know, uh, you know, so scholarly exchange is like publicity, always good. Um, any other questions for the, yes, please. Yeah, and, and following on, I think, from that previous question as well. Uh, Joel Fisher, University of Nottingham. Um, I really enjoyed the takedown of effective computing, especially the first three talks today. Um, but my question is for Ola, actually, because uh, uh, it comes in as quite a contrast um, seeing, your, uh, seeing your talk. But I'm wondering, after hearing the, the previous three speakers, um, where do you fall on, on whether this, you, you think overall we should be looking at um, detecting in the your case early early onset Alzheimer's from speech uh, or should we abandon it like one of the other speakers suggested so do you feel wh where do you where do you feel about this now after being in this session yeah it's a very very good uh, question so um, I, I started like my my PhD uh, doing the like detecting the early signs and thinking that this is you know what we should do and now as I'm finishing up I'm more and more come across the ethical considerations and now started like doubting whether we should actually do that and obviously uh, listening to the uh, first three speakers I think is um, leaning me uh, towards uh, that side but then again. I'd be very interested in how we could do this ethically because I can see like that there are uh, potential benefits in the future, but uh, the the ethical development of uh, the the issues that come up are 
definitely there, right? Like the ethical uh, issues. So we need to address those to ensure that these technologies are used in the best possible way, I think. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, hi, I'm Selim with Google DeepMind. Um, it's kind of a follow-up to this, actually, because I, I'm not convinced that this is the same in all of the other scenarios. It's kind of a, um, a forced use. It's a use for surveillance. In your scenario, it's an option. I imagine if somebody, if you wanted to get early testing for Alzheimer, you could rely on that technology, but you wouldn't have to, other than when you're kind of a call center worker. So I just wanted to say, like, I think they're hugely different. Yeah, uh, I, ideally, if it was your choice to get tested, right? But if we all had an app in our pocket and we could go around and be like, hey, you'll have Alzheimer's in like 10 years, blah, blah, that wouldn't be ideal. But yeah, if it's like voluntary and consented use, then yes. Any, any other questions for the speakers? We are sort of running over time. Uh, I actually did have a bunch of questions, but they'll all go, they'll all go offline. Uh, but thank you all for actually coming up and it's terrible when only the session chair is asking questions. It's a wonderful outcome. Thank you for being a great audience. Thank you for the wonderful uh, presentations. And uh, I will engage you in debate later. <laughs> thank you.